Hey everyone, welcome to the Fireside Chat number 31 on Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and today we are talking about viability. It's tricky when coming up with a plan for something you want to do as a musician to know what is viable. What will make money? What will people want? Ultimately, when coming up with something to do, you want to know that there will be an audience and preferably an audience with open wallets. There's a way to approach how to figure this out, which is what we dive into today. Before we get started, a couple of quick things. Please join the conversation at facebook.com slash crushing classical, as well as crushing classical on Instagram. If you love our content, it would mean the world to us for you to comment and share it with your classical musician friends and colleagues. I'd like to thank Fix Music for being a sponsor of Crushing Classical Podcast. Fixmusic.com is your online resource for affordable, high quality sheet music. Fix also offers unique buying options for individuals, teachers, and schools. Whether you have a large private teaching studio or you run a music program, Fix has a solution for you. Contact them through their website for more information. Fix offers priority and priority express shipping at super affordable rates, meaning they do not pad their shipping rates to make more money. If you need sheet music fast, Fix will expedite it to you as inexpensively as possible. Also, remember to use the discount code CRUSH and get 10% off your order. Let's get started. Hey, Eileen, how are you? Yo. <laughs> I decided to do a new greeting today. That's good. I love it. Yo. Yo, cool. yo, yo. Here we are. So today we're going to talk about viability and what is viable when you're trying to come up with ideas for things that you want to do outside the traditional job path mm -hmm. as a classical musician. So we were chatting about this yesterday and some stuff came up and we we're like, you know what, let's dig into this deeper tomorrow on the fireside. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Everybody wants to know, um, you know, is my idea going to work or there's a lot, you know, and I've talked to several subscribers about this. Um, either message them or like I was message, messaging with them, uh, certainly in the classical cats group. And then also, um, calls mm -hmm. in the last, let's say in the last three weeks, four weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because not everything you want to do, like some things you want to do make sense and other things don't. And that's where you want to start. That's what we're actually going to start with today is. What is vi like, how do you know if something is viable and what do you, what's the process for that? Right. It's what's kind of a tough one because we're all it coming is. from classical musicians are just coming from, there's these two different kinds of jobs you can have. You can teach or you can mm -hmm. go and play in an existing ensemble. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much, those are the choices. Yeah. We're a classical musician. I mean, if you're going to get a job. Right. That's definitely, yeah, that's it. And so when you're so, thinking about breaking out of that mold, it's hard to break out from like some version of how that looks. Well, so the first thing I notice is that people, this is no surprise, we're in a time when everybody wants to leverage their time. Mm -hmm. You notice that? Everybody wants to leverage their time. So they, you know, you, you hear all this um, this language in the world about, multiple streams of income uh you know there's people you know, there's passive income and there's active income we've talked about this we even yeah. talked about it on a uh, fireside with one of the money guys yeah know? um actually with both of the money guys that we've had on so far mm -hmm. and so what's interesting about that is you know everyone is looking so everyone is looking at what they can do in many cases from that point of view well i would you know, if I didn't have to drive somewhere, like, so I'll use an example. A lot of people think I could give lessons online for my instrument. Right. That's the most common, if you notice that, that's the most common idea people come up with for a unique side hustle or unique career or whatever. You notice that? Yeah. Cause you think, okay, lots of people work online. They use their computers to get to create yeah. an income stream. But the thing I know how to do is teach. So that mm -hmm. must be the answer. Yeah. So that must be the answer is I can just teach, but I can teach online. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
Okay, so let's dig into that for a second. What is the, I, I, the first thing I do, is I don't get excited about ideas. I look and see where the holes are. That's the first thing I look for. It's not about being negative. It's about being realistic. Right. So what's the first question? You know, let, let's just, you know, dig into this idea, this idea of online lessons. I teach my instrument online to students online. What's the first question, problem, anything that you see about that? What's the first hole you see about that? Um, for me, what I've always wondered is with sound quality on a Skype call, first of all, you can't really hear top quality. A lot of times okay. it's sort of sketchy connection. You know what I mean? Okay. And, and mm -hmm. the, the other thing is technique. You can't really see everything when you're not in person. Mm -hmm. Um, especially you know cuz the instrument might, and and the hands and the mouth and everything might not all fit into the screen that you've got the camera pointed at or whatever so mm -hmm. there's that um mm -hmm. i always thought lessons just seemed like they were a in person activity so the online yeah. lesson thing was was something that kind of went over my head when i first started seeing that was a popular thing to do Okay, so that's a so that's from a teacher perspective. Now look at it from a buyer perspective. What's the problem with it? What's the hole? What are the holes with it? So like as a buyer. teacher, you're concerned about that, right? You're not necessarily yeah. going to be able to see the technique. You're not going to, right? So look at right. it from a buyer perspective. What's a hole? Let's say my kid is, needs to have a lesson. Am I going to choose someone online or am I going to choose someone in person? Definitely person. Well, how and how old is the kid, by the way? What are we looking at? What age are you thinking? Um, junior high, like typical starting age band, maybe. Okay. All right. So that's where you went. Okay. So, um, how about uh, if the student was, say, in high school, has played the horn for a few years? Right. Um. Yeah, still, do, I'm just Do you thinking, see the same issue? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My concern yeah. is that it's just not going to be a a full, a fully, um, like, you're going to get as much out of it as you would in, if you were face-to-face -face with the person. It just doesn't seem like it's possible. If I'm, if I'm buying it, if I'm like, if I'm the buyer looking, looking for my child. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. maybe, you know, like maybe as you're getting older, say, say I'm in college and I want to study with someone and they're in Berlin and I'm here, that might be something yeah. that I would do because it's cheaper than going to Berlin, but Is it would it be like a, that's in the Berlin Philharmonic. Are you thinking? Yeah. Something like that. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just pulling that out of thin air, you know, well, someone, I, and I, but, but I think it's a good point though. So let's say you want to study with. Um, somebody, let's say you want to take a lesson or two with someone who's in the Berlin Philharmonic. Well, then it would make sense to do something online if you're not going to fly to Berlin. Right. And you're going to pay probably out the nose for that because it's somebody in the Berlin Phil, no? Yeah, you are. And I, my, my concern would still be they aren't going to know, um, really the sound quality that I'm producing because it's over the internet waves. It's not going to sound as good as it will in, in person. So you're going to, you're not going to, you're still not going to get the kind of feedback that you would get if you were right there with the person. Right. Sure. And remember, we're talking about, you're a, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about your career here for a minute. You are a high level player, you know, um, freelancer, uh, definitely on the audition track, played in some orchestras, right? So, yeah, you know, there's a bit, there's a big difference between someone who is you a professional, and then someone who is a kid in junior high school or high school. Right. So the problem with online lessons, you just need to look at this for a minute. First of all, I'm just going to tell you what the holes are. And, and you would have to, again, things being viable, you have to actually deal with the concerns that are there. The, there are concerns. In anything you want to do, there's always some concern or some problem that needs to be solved. All, right. Everything that you brought up is really is valid. So, but if you are, I want you to imagine, you know, 
uh, most kids, when they play an instrument, when they start playing an instrument, they're not serious. They're playing in band and they're playing with their friends and it's fun. That's what uh -huh. band is when you first, right? And then, yeah. you know, some people love the marching band and so they continue in high school and they play in the marching band or they play, you know what I'm saying? But most of those kids, the majority, are not going to music school. Right. Right? They're not going to be a professional. Exactly. So, if you're a parent, I just want you to imagine, if you're a parent and you've got little Johnny, Johnny's your son, and he plays, um, I don't know, trumpet. And little Johnny comes to you and says, this is your son, right? He comes to you and says, mom, I want to take private lessons. Uh -huh. And there is either a band director or somebody at school that offers trumpet lessons. So you can choose from someone who's coming to the school or even even a music store a lot of music stores you know how they have private lessons at certain yeah. you know depending on where you live right they have that yeah. um you know you could take lessons at the local music store you could take lessons at school if they have a trumpet teacher um a lot of times band directors played trumpet or learn trumpet or no trumpet so they also teach right mm -hmm. so as a mom little johnny's your son as a as a mom are you going to sign him up for lessons in person? Or are you going to sign him up for lessons online? What is your most likely move? Absolutely in person, like without a doubt. Without a doubt. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. and why why is that from a parent point of view? It's just, it just makes so much more sense. First of all, they're already okay. at school. So like, if you're just talking about yeah. logistical reasons, they're already sure, at okay. school, they can stay after yep. school right then and there and do it. Um, yep. there is just, there's a kind of different kind of relationship that you develop with somebody as a teacher when you're in person versus when you're looking at them mm -hmm. on a screen. Yep. Um, so there's that. Yep. Um, and, and then if I'm, if I'm thinking about if I'm, I'm comparing that choice mm -hmm. versus like setting something up online, I have to set mm -hmm. up the computer. I have to worry about technology stuff that I might not um, you know, I mean, how many times have you gotten on a Skype call where the Skype, where there's no sound <laughs> or whatever, oh, yeah, and you're like, happens. disconnect, oh, yeah. restart your computer, update Skype yeah. or whatever you have to do. Mm -hmm. You know, this is all crap that you, that you would have to deal with on top yeah, so of. there's an extra. Yeah. So, yeah. And yeah. so, and by the way, would, would you, would it impact your choice? I'm just curious if online lessons were less expensive than in person, would that impact your choice? For me personally, um, I'm looking for the best experience when I'm shopping for a, a thing like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So I, you know, if it's ten five dollars cheaper to do it online, I'm not. That's not going to be a factor. In yeah. My so decision. like, if it's ten dollars cheaper, you don't care, basically. No. It's, no. You don't care. Okay. And and I I would agree with that because most parents, you know, they'll op they open their wallets for their kids. That's what yeah. parents do. Yeah. You know what I mean. It's yeah. not like, um, you know, if, if your daughter wants to do something, um, for you, uh, if, in most cases, I'm sure money is pretty much no object. You're like, well, if you she make wants it happen. to, you know, I, yeah, you make yeah. it happen. If your daughter wants to take art class, then you figure out that she's going to get an art class. Even if you have to drive 30 minutes to get to a, you know, $25 cheaper art class or whatever, she's still going to get into art class no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if it, even if it, even if you have to spend more time in the car to get her there. Right. Yeah, I've done it. That's like an exact example from my life. I've done that. Oh, it is. Okay. I didn't yeah. know. That. So, I mean, I, I knew that you were taking her to our class, but again, you know, you just make it work. You make yeah. the money work. You make the time work. You make the whole thing work. Yeah. Um, this is, this is why I'm just going to say this online lessons. Are they viable? Um, it's a crapshoot at best. And it's, um, it's just not. It is not the cash cow. It is not going to be the cash cow you expect it to be. If all you're teaching students how to do is play an instrument, it is not going to be the cash cow you're expecting it to be. Right. Because of there's, you know, there's the ability to take lessons live. Right. There's the ability to take lessons live. And one of the things I always remind people whenever I talk to them about this, because I've had several conversations, you know, one of the, um, objections that was brought up to me recently was, well, 
I, I said, why would they choose you to do online lessons? And the person said, well, because I'm, I'm better than their current teacher. I'm better than the band director teaching them how to play whatever trumpet. Um, and here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, little Johnny's mom doesn't care if you're in the Chicago symphony, she does not need, um, right. she does not need little Johnny to be taught by the principal or sorry, the second trumpet of the Chicago symphony. She doesn't right. care about that. What she cares about is little Johnny gets a lesson on trumpet. That's what she cares about. Yeah. So I think there's a um, misunderstanding that how good you are is somehow going to factor into your ability to do online lessons. Incorrect. Incorrect. Because how good you are is subjective. You yeah. think you're good. I'm sure you're good. That's, it's not a matter of you being good or not. It's just not, that's not the reason why little Johnny's taking lessons. Little Johnny isn't taking lessons because of how good you are. Little Johnny's taking lessons because of how good he wants to be. And there is no parent, especially of a younger age student that really understands the value of a really good trumpet player or a really good violinist or whatever. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It took yeah. my parents years. It took my parents years to understand that studying with people in Chicago Symphony or whatever, Symphony, right? Philadelphia Orchestra, whatever. It took them years to understand why that would even matter. And it didn't matter until I was dead serious about it. Until I was hell bent on, I'm going to be a clarinet player. Right. It doesn't matter until, you know, you see what I'm saying? And so this is what, what I mean by viability. Just because you have the idea in your head does not mean it's going to work in real life. And this is what nobody likes to talk about. Nobody likes to talk about the elephant in the middle of the dining room table that everybody's having dinner around. Right. Does it make sense? Whatever your idea is, does it make sense? And you have to look at the real world of that. Right. What's the real world? So what's another idea that people have? What's another idea people come up with? And let's talk through it. Because this is about thinking, by the way, I'm not smarter than you, and I'm not even saying if it's going to work or not. I'm saying if you're going to make it work, you have to be able to deal with the reality that you're building your alternate career in. Right. There's a reality. So what else do people say they want to do? Um, I know you've gotten a bunch of messages of crushing classical. Yeah. Um. Well, I can I let's talk about something that seems like it's pretty popular now. Sure. And I want to hear your take on it. The popularity okay. of taking classical music and putting it into like a bar, you know, playing something out in a bar or a more casual environment. And we've talked mm -hmm. about this a little bit, mm -hmm. but what the viability of that is because it's still the same stuff. It's just in a different location. Yeah. Like the same, the same repertoire that you could get. Yeah, like, you're taking them out of the concert hall. Yeah. And, and so like people, every time, every time that musician, I'm not saying it's wrong at all. I'm just curious. Of, I just want to talk it out because I see it like a lot, like a lot. Mm -hmm. You go, okay. So people play chamber music at a church or at a concert hall and it's buttoned up and it's very, kind of quiet and everything else. What if we take the same string quartets or the same chamber music, but we do it in a, in a button down kind of relaxed environment. People can wear jeans and they can still hear, you know, Beethoven string quartet, but they can have a beer instead of, you know, sitting there in their seat. That's well, that, not comfortable. That assumes that people, that the reason why people, uh, that, I mean, what, what you're really saying by, by taking a classical concert, let's say, and moving venues is what you're saying is the venue is the problem. The music isn't. Right. Is that true? Well, that's what I am curious about. And so I think that people well, assume that the music isn't the problem. True? Well, I think that, I think that, um, you're, I think it's kind of missing the, the, bigger picture a little bit like, okay. or maybe not understanding what's happening with, um, 
classical music. I don't know. This might be this might be a really big conversation, but like the classical it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a really big conversation. It's actually pretty simple. Okay. I guess it's just an understanding of what people think is necessary or what the problem really is with, with like growing an audience for classical music, I guess is the thing. Why do we need to grow an audience for classical music? Right. And that's the question that maybe people aren't asking. Why? Yeah. Why is it necessary for us to grow an audience for classical music? Classical music, the audience is dying on some level already. Why right. are we trying to regrow it? Why is that important? This is why classical music has to evolve. Right. We don't need to keep classical music in place. We need to evolve classical music. Exactly. And so I think they think, people think that evolving it means moving it to a different location, but keeping it in the right. same, rep, you know. And, and I, and I, and I challenge that. That is not. Because that is assuming that the problem is the venue. Right. And what it is, is it keeps the same people who are already going and hearing it, possibly, except for they're like, well, I'll hear it again, but I'll just be able to have a beer when I'm doing it instead. Right. You know. Right. And, and you know, of course, you know, and and I, and I think it's interesting that people think that. I think it's interesting people think that just because you move it to another venue that everyone's just going to love it. Right. I mean, how do you know they're not just going there for the beer? Right. How do you know? You know, and you just happen to be there playing. Yeah. And it's funny because um, indie rock people are the ones who are like, yeah, you know, this thing doesn't work for me playing in a bar or a coffee shop because no one's listening to my music. They're just right. there because they want to have a coffee. That's you right. know, and then classical have, musicians I mean, are going to like, walk in. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Like they want that because they don't, that's not their life. It's like, they don't, they don't live it. Like the indie rock people who are going, gee, I wish I had a concert hall where everyone would be quiet and listen to my music, you know? Yeah. It's yeah, like the exactly. grass is greener or something. Exactly. And, and listen, I mean, you know, could you be discovered that way? I suppose. But I just, I think that um, classical musicians are missing the point of what the actual problem is. And, and I'm not saying by the way that classical music is a problem. I'm saying that, the interest in classical music is dwindling, and so classical music has to evolve. If you want a, an audience, or if you want a new audience, you have to appeal to that audience. What everyone in classical music seems to want to do is get everybody to like our stuff that we already have. Yeah. Well, we know that's not working. How do we know that? Because the audiences are dwindling. That's how we know that. Right. We know that that's already not working. And so, um, and by the way, you know, there's a lot of people who are evolving classical music. I mean, you're interviewing a lot of them. Yeah. You're interviewing people who are evolving and understand this conversation we're having. Yeah. Um, I, I think what we're finding is the musicians are hell bent on keeping the, Everybody needs to love Shostakovich conversation alive. Yeah. Shostakovich is beautiful. Everybody should love it. You know, the Nielsen Quintet is amazing. Everybody should learn, should listen to it and love it. Yeah. Hell, my stepdad is, uh, you know, he's, he loves opera. His whole thing is opera is so wonderful and everybody should experience it and, and love it. But that's not realistic. Yeah. No, nobody should anything. And that's what, that's what is so interesting about the whole viability conversation is, you know, you I think that's, I think, right. I think that's where you're, you're just hitting the nail on the head right there. Nobody should anything. Nobody right? should anything. Yeah. Yeah. You like what you like and you don't like what you don't like and you can't shove what you think people should like down their throats. And, and that's what you're kind of doing. If you, you know, it's like an ish. If you send, if you put classical music into a bar. Yeah. Like you should like this. Know. And yeah. since you're here, since I know that you like beer already, yep. Yep. Um, you're going to love this. If I put it in front of you while you're drinking beer and then That's maybe right. you'll buy concerts to the symphony or That's tickets, right. sorry, tickets to the symphony, That's you know? Right. That's right. Yeah. And that's another thing classical musicians do, by the way, is they go, 
we'll go and play this really cool piece at this bar and then we'll hand out uh flyers to our next deal and then they're like their next concert and then so they invite people and people go they they love the thing that you played that was evolved right it was sort of contemporary and you know it wasn't it was like quasi classical music and then you invite them to your concert wherever it is at a church or whatever or some venue and they walk in and now they have to listen to beethoven that's a bait and switch yeah that's a bait and switch that's what you're doing i mean you're basically you're like oh i'm going to lure them in with this fancy thing that i'm doing with this this evolved amazing you know whatever arrangement i created and it's it's it uses string instruments and it uses orchestral instruments and then i'm going to get and i'm going to hand out flyers and go oh if you love this you got to come to our concert and now they walk in and they got to listen to beethoven that's just bait and switch that's what that is yeah you just i mean there's this thing going on in classical music where everybody just wants to stick with everything that was written back when it was written and it's got to be played the way it's always been played. It's got to be done the way, and I'm talking about in the U S by the way, I realize that there is a, um, at least partially thriving classical music audience over the pond. I'm aware of that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm aware of that. You know, uh, they, there is a, still a, love for classical music in other countries i'm aware of that i'm talking about i'm really referring to the usa right now because that's not it's just not the prevailing interest classical music is not and what i'm seeing right now is that everybody is so you know classical musicians are so committed everybody that loves the music you know <laughs> and everybody has to love it because i love it you know that's that's really <laughs> what everyone is doing. And and you, you you just sit down and just look for a minute. Yeah. You know, you can, audiences are interested in a lot of things, but you have to actually get interested in what they're interested in if you want to evolve it and yourself. Yeah. You have to get interested in that. And that's what be ultimately becomes viable. And that's why earlier we were talking about online lessons. That's what I mean. You have to get interested in what people are interested in. I know that the mother of eighth grader little Johnny, who, you know, he's an okay trumpet player, doesn't care if little Johnny is getting taught by, you know, a guy with uh, two music degrees. Right. Instead of one or none. Like, she doesn't even care. Does he know how to play trumpet? Awesome. He's qualified. <laughs> meet, you, meet you at 3.30. Okay. Little Johnny's available for his half hour lesson at 3.30. You know what I'm right. saying? I, exactly. I, think, I just think it's so funny how classical musicians take this so seriously, you know, because we went to school for it and we're like the best at what we do. And, you know, like I get all that because I was a clarinetist and I get it. You know, there's a, <laughs> you know, there's a, seriousness about it but what we forget is that the audience and who we're teaching and the things we want that's that doesn't not everybody is where we are about it i know and that's what that's where the suffering comes in right because you're like oh yeah. i got all these degrees and if you yes. if you if you dare to step off of that pedestal for a second you yep. admit to yourself yep. that it doesn't matter you know but oh, like if, if you yeah. stay there you're like but i'm so qualified I can do, yep. you know, I'm, I have a master's degree. I mean, I feel like that, like, geez, I have a master's degree in this. Jeez. Listen, nobody is, and we, I'm going to jump back to this joke we always make on this, on the fireside, you know, nobody is checking Kenny G's resume right now. Right. <laughs> nobody. nobody checked his resume. Like nobody cares. They don't, I don't even know if he went to music school. I have no idea. I don't care either. No, no I, I don't no. care. Right. And and so I just think that there's this attachment thing going on where attachment to the music and people loving it and attachment to I need to teach lessons and I'm better than, you know, OK. I mean, th this is why you're having trouble evolving. Any anyone. I don't care who's listening to this. You're having because of all of your attachments about how good you are and how long you studied and how many hours you practiced and all this stuff. And, and you you've forgotten the audience. 
And if you would just put your eyes on the audience for a minute, there's so much the audience can tell you about what they're interested in. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, what do we know? I mean, if you just look at TV, I, I realize you just started watching TV again recently. Oh, wait, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Because you, you don't even have TV. You have Netflix, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Amazon. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know what's all on there because I honestly, I don't watch Netflix, but um, I'm I'm probably like one of, you know, very few people who don't watch Netflix. I don't really care. But on live TV, you know, what do people love? Well, what are the shows that people flock to? First of all, we know reality shows people flock to. And what do they love? They love Dancing with the Stars. They love The Voice, that show uh -huh. The Voice. Uh, America's Got Talent. Yeah. Right? What are some other shows that people love? Um, uh, More of the same of those. Yeah, like American or... Idol. Is American Idol over? But they, they have like America's Got Talent. and Yeah, America's Got Talent sort of makes up for that, I think. Yeah. Sort of the new, you know like a better version of American Idol. Um, but but this is my point, though. You can get clues what people are interested in by what are people watching? What are people uh, spending their time doing? What are people, you know? Oh, yeah, people, for oh, sure. Oh, and yeah, and like people go to, uh, what do you call it? There's a, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Like um, you can go to clubs or you can go to concerts where, you know, there's a DJ everyone is there dancing um there's there's all those those are things people flock to people love burning man oh my god That's all these things burning right? man what's that other one that um everyone was laughing at recently the the california one where all the girls dress the same like they sort of dress like hippies with like flowers um, in their hair and stuff what was that one called is it coachella yes yes coachella yep yeah coachella, so that's really um, popular now these big giant Music festivals yeah, yeah. where you just go and you party exactly. all That way. was the word I was looking for. Music festival. You got it. That was the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't go, I don't go to these things, but I know about them. Um, also people love, uh, let's see. Um, they love interactive events like South by Southwest. It used to be a very small conference. Now it's very big. And now they call it South by South Southwest interactive. I think they, they gave it a new name. Um, oh, another one is, um, people love sporting events like, uh, um american ninja warrior mm -hmm. i'm a big fan of american ninja warrior um people love Bur uh not burning man people love tough mutter so you go they have them in uh, every state they the tough mutter goes to every state every year and they go i think they do them all year long throughout the united states and maybe even in other countries they do it but it's a big business now and people go and they you know push themselves physically to the limit Right. So, you know, something I'm noticing, it's really a social yeah. thing that they like when they, when people it's get social. together, they want to, yes. so whenever there's a music festival, so this is something that classical music has not evolved with because they, exactly. I mean, classical they're, they're music is right stuck now. in, yeah. Yes. Classical music it's is social. stuck in, this is an elite thing. This is, and this yeah. is coming up this weekend, actually, there's a gala at the symphony, right? Yeah. And, and it's so funny because they're sticking to their old ways. They're, yeah, they're still trying They're And why they're doing that, I'll tell you why they're doing that, because they're trying to appeal to the constituents that have always given them money, because yep. that's what they have to rely on, because they're not evolving. That, mm -hmm. And they're stuck there. They're stuck there. That's all yeah. they can do. Because yeah. and seriously, the longer you keep in place the things that are causing the diminishing of the thing you're trying to keep alive the more it diminishes you need to understand that that's yeah. like this is this is not <laughs> hard to figure out right oh my gosh i'm seeing so much right now it's so true right? like why is, like you don't know what's viable look at what people are flocking to and you'll know what's viable right and that's that's my question is why do we um not look in the regular population when we're seeking out what we want to do like well, it's because we're just know. stuck i guess in that mo mode because that's where we were trained and we don't look look outside of it i guess well and Ooh. i can tell you I'll, i mean i'll just tell you my experience i there was never a time when i had you know i was a classical musician for 20 years and then i quit and 
I was never introduced to or invited to do anything, um, you know, like I, I, I learned straight classical. Nobody mm -hmm. ever introduced me to jazz. Right. Nobody ever said, hey, this would be a good idea, Eileen, if you learned this genre instead of just doing classical music. It would be really great if you uh, branched out. Nobody, there was no encouraging of branching out in any way. Which is crazy because clarinet is totally an instrument that goes into jazz and klezmer and other yeah. different genres. Yeah, klezmer, exactly. No. There's a lot of other genres. And yeah, exactly. And I um I just was raised. It was strict. It was uh there was a you know, the classically trained way of doing it, and that's mm -hmm. how it was. And I think a lot of classical musicians are raised that way, and that's part of the rigid thing you're talking about. Yes. That's how I, I was raised. That. Yeah, it's very one track, one track mind sort of blinders on. That's really my experience of it. Yeah, I mean, that's the way you're raised. That's what you do. You go um, major in your instrument. And yeah. you're like, and, and, yeah, and, and yeah. let's just bring this in right now. I mean, I know that this is probably not the kindest thing to say, but, you know, Tracy's been doing some reach outs lately to uh, music schools. And mm -hmm. I can't tell you like. Normally, she like for the most part, she gets a positive response. Oh, you know, I haven't heard of Crushing Classical. Let's get on a call. Let's talk. Like, you know, she's reaching out to let people know about the existence of Crushing Classical. And we've had some some uh, <laughs> teachers, uh, university professors. Let's just put it that way. Professors yeah. who've written back. Uh, I mean, say it, Tracy. Like, what what kind of response have you gotten from some people? Yeah. Luckily, it's not too many people have responded this way, but there's been a handful yeah, of people, people who... Have, there's been a handful yeah. of people so far. And yeah. that's just, I mean, this is going to be a numbers game because that that ratio that you're seeing right now is still going to exist on a larger scale. So right. You know. But right. what are they saying when they reply, like this little handful of people? Well, one person was like, I, a, a couple of people were like, um, I don't have time to talk about anything else except for what I need to cover in my lessons about what I'm teaching, you know, the instrument that I teach. So it won't be yeah. possible for me to share this information with my students. Yeah. Which um, is really what she's asking for. She's asking for, you know, because not a lot of people still don't know about crushing classical. So she's reaching out and saying, Hey, we just want you to know about this podcast. You know what we're doing, what, what our intentions are. Um, we're w interested in what your students are struggling with. Like we actually want to know what people are looking for and what they want. Yeah. And we want to, we want to make sure that it's targeting what people are concerned about. When we yeah, talk, we want to actually, yeah, we want to serve people. And so it's interesting because some of the people have written back and said, you know, I don't have time for this. I'm not going to get into this conversation with my students. I yeah. I teach what I teach and I'm going to stick with that. Like there, and that's just the rigidness we're talking about. That's a yeah. great example of the rigidness. Like, yeah, I, at this you know, point in my career, and some, yep. someone said something like at this point in my career, I can't, I can't change the way I do things or something like that. Yep. Another yep. person wrote, why me? <laughs> yeah. Why, why, me? Me? why Why would you reach out to me? You know? Yeah. That, that was another, that was another, and it's interesting because that all those responses are fine, but you have to understand that all those responses are indicative of what I'm talking about, which is this rigidness and this, we're not going to change. We're not going to evolve. We're going to keep things the way they are. And everybody needs to like our stuff because it's great. Mm -hmm. And we that's, had, that's the prevailing attitude in classical music. Yeah. Our shit is great and everybody should love it. And the only reason why they don't love it is because they haven't heard it. That's <laughs> exactly. not true. <laughs> that is not true. Yeah. That is not true. Right. Let's take an example of music that you don't like. Let's say, what, what's, what's a music that you would like kill yourself if you had to hear it for more than um, 20, 10 minutes? Definitely at the top of the list, heavy metal. Definitely at the top of the list. Okay. So Eileen, um, it's just because you haven't heard enough heavy metal. Right. So exactly. let's. I'm gonna. Enough heavy metal. So yeah. I'm gonna play a concert for you where um, I'll take you into a bar and I'll play right. your favorite kind of music, but then I'll right. give you, you know, then I'll sell you a ticket for heavy metal and we'll go hear an hour concert together. Right. You know? and, and I'll expect that I'm gonna hear the cool shit that you played at the bar, but when I get into <laughs> the place where you want me to go, you're gonna play your heavy metal shit and think I'm gonna stay. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it doesn't make way, sense. Yeah, and by the way, country music is pretty far up there for me as well. I don't like country music Me very too. Much. I can't okay. stand it. I can't yeah, stand I'm it. I'm just not a fan. Most of it I can't stand. A few songs here and there I like, but 
mostly I can't stand it. Um, so heavy metal, uh, I'm not R and B. You know, it's kind of okay. I don't really. Not but you know, what's interesting it. about all these different genre genres you're, we're talking about right now. They've all evolved mm-hmm. a lot, and so like country, yeah, yeah. I know for a fact that like, I mean, don't wouldn't you consider um, Shania Twain was country, and so Whoa. was. Um, Taylor Swift wasn't she considered country at first? She started. She started as country. I think she's. I think she's a little bit of a crossover now. She's yeah. Evolved. So these people and like country has evolved mm-hmm. so that there's like another version of country that's sort of like a rock country or like a yeah, independent totally. country. So there's like there's types of country that people like. So maybe a Taylor Swift audience wouldn't necessarily be someone who goes and hears. Um, who, you know, I don't know. There was one guy who was really big and popular back when I was in high school and lots of kids liked him and I didn't like him. And he wore a big giant cowboy hat all the time. Um, I can't remember his name, but like, um, that wouldn't be like considered the same genre by country Western people that like that, that type of music. They might not even yeah. like Taylor Swift or whatever. And then she has her whole exactly. own audience. So like, that's, I think that's where we're getting at with the evolution thing, you know, like, yeah, I mean, you have to evolve it. Classical music has to evolve. There's no other choice for it. Yeah. Um, you know, continuing, continuing to shove, um, I'm just using Shostakovich as an example, but it could be anybody, Beethoven, Shostakovich, I don't care who it is, but continuing to shove that down people's throats especially quote unquote new audiences and thinking that they're just going to like it because you like it is not viable. It is not, um, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't well, make any and sense. Recently, and this is, sorry. Well, recently, um, I interviewed Steve Hackman and his episode is yeah. coming up really soon. And we're talking about this and actually he did a really cool, um, Ted talk. And he talks about how, like, historically, classical music did evolve. I mean, that's why we have so many different kind of sub-genres within classical music. But then, it, and and so some people say, like, oh, yeah, well, it is evolving now still because now we have new music. And now we have, like, composers who are writing new music in the classical genre. But that, so so in a way, things are evolving. And he what he's doing is evolving um, classical music and combining it with other music, which he says isn't new. He says it in the interview, like people have been doing that for decades with, Mm -hmm. you know, mixing things on, like as a DJ, mixing things up and making mashups and things. Yeah, that's been going on for years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Doing mashups? Yeah, because he does mashups. They've been doing mashups for years. For years. That's what he talks about. But um, what's not evolving is the way that it's presented and the way that you keep bringing up, like making it that you always have to hear Beethoven nine every year or whatever, you know, like there's always these, the it's, it's more of a cultural uh, way. Like, like what we were just talking about with the gala, like they're, they're keeping things, they're keeping things um, elitist like that. Like Mm -hmm. this is the way that it is. These are the people who like it. We don't want to change anything. And it's because of the structure. Like there's so, there's so much that goes into whether or not something evolves. Like, Country music, nobody, maybe, maybe there are people, maybe there's a conversation of people who said, you know, I don't like, I don't like that country music is changing towards Taylor Swift, you know, maybe they don't like that. Maybe there are people that are like that. But to me, it seems like more of a seamless evolution with different things because there's not like some kind of cultural structure around it. Like there is in classical, like people train and they go and they major in it and then they come out and they have to do this certain thing and fit into this certain mold. That's what the attach. That's what the attachment is all about, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Taylor Swift didn't go to music school and go. I need to continue teach. I need to continue singing twangy country music. Right, right. She didn't. She, she just became who she wanted to be. And you know, that's yeah. what I'm struggling with. Honestly, it's kind of a good t- time to bring this up right now because um, I'm realizing that because of this, you know, lack of being open to evolving and like you said, not being open to or being introduced at all to other genres as a clarinet player. I mean, a horn horn is even worse because it's not traditional at all for horn to be in any other genre besides orchestra, classical orchestra music. And so I'm here, I'm sitting over here going, okay, so now my playing career can either be, I get called for some extra horn position somewhere because I'm not taking auditions anymore um, and play extra on, you know, 
some Strauss piece that has eight horns on it, or I can create something else. Those are my two choices. And since I don't have any experience creating something else, I'm like, I'm, I'm in this like total empty space right now. It's just really interesting. To think about. Mm -hmm. yep. So, and that's kind of scary, yeah. but I see other people well, doing it and I go, okay, I see what I well, have to do. Here's the other, well, the other challenge you're running into though is, and this is what everybody does. They say, I have to figure this out. And what you don't understand is it gets figured out in conversation. Yeah. And that's what we talked about before we hit the record button today. Yeah. It's, um, it's figured out. And when you collaborate with other people, when you, you know, it's not your job to figure everything out. It's your job to have enough conversations that it gets figured out. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have the answer. And I think that's the biggest problem in classical music is you are that you have to have the answer. You have to know the answer. You know, it has to be perfect. Yeah. Before it can be heard, all of that. There's all of that. And, or, and, and in many cases, you probably don't want to talk to anybody until you know exactly what it's supposed to be, <laughs> which is the problem. <laughs> right. So yeah. nothing, nothing gets created. Nothing gets, nothing evolves. Nothing gets created. Everything stays in your head because until it's perfect, you can't talk about it. Right. That's what everyone does. Yeah. And so we, before we, before we started recording, um, we were just talking about it a little bit. And I said that I reached out to a couple composers and hadn't heard anything. And you were like, did you reach out to any? Cause I had said before, I wanted to have a DJ. I want there to be a DJ. And, right. um, and well, and I what I said to her is, so do you need to have a composer? And I was like, um, yes. <laughs> and I said, why? Right. And then I said, well, I suppose I could arrange things and maybe, you know, I can arrange things. It can be an arrangement of something. Yeah, it can be and, a com and, combination. And you, and you don't have to arrange it. You could get an arranger. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, so and so, what she was was thinking was this needs to be an original piece, or the concert needs to have original music. And I thought, why? Why does it have to have like says who? Who made up that rule? Right. You know, and and that's what everyone's doing though. You've got this idea in your mind of what it has to be instead of letting it evolve into what it's going to be, whatever that is. Why can't it be a creation of multiple people? Why does it have to be your exact vision? Right? I know. And that's the, that's the definition of collaboration. And it's so new to me as far as um, collaborating and creating something. And today I shared, a, I shared this thing on my page um, that just came across my Facebook feed. And it was so inspiring. It was a um, a Radiohead thing where mm -hmm. Radiohead collaborated with Hans Zimmer, who's a movie composer. I'm sure people, yeah. most people know. And um, they created this score for this BBC Ocean documentary. And they were talking about like the inspiration behind how they created these sounds and everything. And all, mm -hmm. all they kind of said was instead of composing the music, they, they came, they invented a new effect. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's interesting. Like they're totally going outside of the box of even this needs to be composed, you know? Yeah, exactly. And so, exactly. so that was, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. And I'm like, there's so much and by the, yeah, available I mean, you know to me. You couldn't do a concert. How do you know you couldn't do a concert that's entirely improvised? I know the only reason that scares me is because I've never done it. Yep. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. I mean, and by the way, it doesn't have to be that, but I'm just saying it's possible, right? Yeah. It could be that. At least part, it know, could part be partially, you know, too. Yeah, it could be. Um, And and all it is, is you deciding that that's what it's going to be. Yeah. And then, you know, let, so in other words, letting that be a possibility. Right. I think, I think that's all that's missing in, you know, in creating a career is that you allow something to be possible. Like you open up your mind to what could be possible instead of some idea that you're married to about what it needs to look like. I think actually that's why music careers don't evolve. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, it has to look a certain way to you. Definitely. That's a reason why they don't evolve. And, and I was also realizing, gee, we're not accustomed to collaboration on music yeah. 
because we're accustomed to getting together and playing a piece that's already written. Hey, do you want to play this? Beethoven yeah. quintet with me. Do you want to play this Mozart yeah. quartet? You know, we don't yeah. say, Hey, do you want to meet with me and figure out something to play? Like that. Yeah. If I asked that question to a majority of classical musicians, they would say, well, what are we going to play? Like, what piece? Yeah. You yeah, know, like, Oh, that sounds pointless. Yeah. Or they just wouldn't compute. Yeah. They'd be like, well, what piece has this instrumentation? Like it wouldn't, mm -hmm. It just wouldn't compute. Like it, it's not on the radar is what I'm saying. Like so much of this yeah. stuff isn't even on the radar. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, again, remember that audience is a big part of what is viable and you have to begin getting interested in what people want, mm -hmm. what they're interested in. And you, all you need to do is look around and you can see what they're interested in. It's very clear what people are interested in. Yeah. If you pay attention at all. So what's going on in the world? You know what people are interested in. And by the way, one of the big themes, I don't know if anyone notices this, but a very big theme right now is competition. People love to compete. Uh, Dancing with the Stars, America's Got Talent. Um, also, people are in love with the unknown, uh, you know, like the, I'm going to call it the underdog. So mm. America's Got Talent and The Voice. These are all people who you would never know about normally. Oh my gosh. You know, so, always the viral video that comes out is the guy who is delivering pizzas, but he can sound like Frank Sinatra or, or the little yes. girl who, you know, I saw this amazing thing where this girl was like, um, had this beautiful voice and she played the piano with her feet because she was born with no arms or something. And it was amazing. Like it was yeah, well, really amazing. I, so yeah, so America's, uh, I say America because I don't know what it's like over the pond, but in America, people are obsessed with the unknown, the person yeah. you've never heard of. Um, how can you put that element into something for a unique career? I'm not going to tell you how. I want you to think about it. And I don't just mean, I, I mean, anyone is listening to this. Right. Um, the element of competition. Um, people love that, you know, competing against each other. Um, that's, that's what America's Got Talent is. That's what the voice is. That's what, uh, um, American Ninja Warrior is, right? Um, people love to be entertained. They love to laugh. We know this yeah. already. Um, you know, what, how can you bring that into it? You know, how, maybe there's comedy or something as part of it. You have to look at what people are, that's what's viable. What's viable is what you see people gravitating towards and falling in love with the shows that get renewed every year, leave clues. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the videos that go viral online, leave clues. Yeah. And you're just not noticing the clues. That's it. <laughs> you're just not looking at what's in front of you. Look at what's in front of you. That's what I mean by what makes sense. You're not looking at what's in front of you. Right. And also, this is another thing. Quit taking yourself so seriously. <laughs> like, um, have a drink or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, that's what I want to say so many times. You know, um, uh, there's someone I know who is actually leaving teaching and has been teaching for a really long time and really kind of had a bit of a meltdown about, gosh, you know, I know they're going to miss me. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be teaching them anymore. And I'm like, well, how old are they? And, you know, they're in basically junior high and high school. And I'm like, um, you're replaceable. I don't know if you realize. I said, are any of those people um, going, planning on auditioning for the Juilliard school in the next three years? <laughs> and she goes, <laughs> no. And I go, then what's the problem? <laughs> you're completely replaceable. Like, don't you get it? It's so funny that these really uber talented classical musicians with two and three degrees are teaching junior high and high school students and getting attached over it. They're not auditioning for Juilliard school tomorrow. You know, Yeah. that's what I mean by you, you, you don't need to relax. Okay. You know, just take your shoes off and your socks off and put your feet up. Right. Just take it easy. Because that's what I mean by there's just too much seriousness around this. There's too much. You guys take yourself so seriously. Everyone is listening. You take yourself way too seriously. I'll put myself Everyone in that camp. Out, right? Everyone's having fun. Everyone's having a great time. 
and wants to be entertained and is laughing and whatever. And the classical musicians are over here. Oh, are, we're dying. <laughs> okay. Really? It doesn't have to go this way. Mm -hmm. You could actually enjoy the evolution of your own craft. You, you really could. You could enjoy it. Yeah, you know, you know? it's. I, I don't mean to blame the upbringing and the education, but I'm gonna. Because <laughs> what I'm gonna say right. <laughs> right now is just that we just get so um ingrained in in the way that we've been brought up and i'm i'm putting wow. myself in that category because i realized I today it. dude i realized today like as i'm thinking about this concert and then i look around at other people that are doing it already like new deco for example like i looked i yeah, i saw a little great stuff too i saw a video of his and i'm like oh man why do i wish i had a new deco <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and why, why do I sit here and think that? Because I want it, everything to be done and perfect already. So I can be enjoying that thing. And yeah. for me, like, and, and there, you know, I know that in the entrepreneur business side of things, there's so many gurus who say like, Oh, it's about the journey. And you've said it to me, like, it's so much better the building process, but we, but as a classical musician, classically trained musician, we're looking at the finish line as the, because look, look at the language we use when you win, when you win, yeah. when yeah. you win, it's not about yeah. any of the wins that you've had so yeah, far. When you win, exactly. Yeah. You know, totally. when you get that when one win. win and keep in mind, you get to win once. <laughs> right. That's it. Just it's one just time. such bullshit. And it's all serious. It's just and so it's much, so, so serious, serious as a heart it. attack. And everybody and just needs to like, Calm down, everybody. Yeah. It's serious you as know? a heart attack, man. That's yeah, why performance yeah. anxiety. That's why they have it. That's why everyone has it. Because yeah. it's oh. like, oh my God, I have one chance to win. And if yep. I don't, I lose. And then I'm back to square one. Like there's no, yeah. there's no looking at like all the growth happening or any of the shit along the way. It's just like, I have this chance mm -hmm. to win. And if I don't win, I've lost and I'm starting over and then I'm a failure and I lose. You know, yeah, it's, and it's funny, and it's funny that every other genre is willing to evolve except for classical music. Yeah, so maybe that's really what the problem is, and that's, and then all these things we're talking about are just symptoms of of the fact that nobody's willing to change. Yeah, I mean, and and that and that's what you're finding with that handful of professors who've written back and said, "I'm not interested in your la 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 that you're doing over there." You know? Yeah, I'm just um, grateful for the ones who are like, "Yes." I've been, I know there's there's yeah. several who write back so and say, many oh, like this that. is amazing. Can't yeah. wait to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah. so we've had, you know, I mean, it really is, it's the smallest percentage, but you just have to know that that small percentage is keeping things in place the way they are. You know, mm -hmm. you, you doing the bait and switch thing where you play a, a cool arrangement or whatever, and then you invite them to Beethoven, like you're part of the problem. Yeah. You know, you're part of the problem. And, um, you know, these, these orchestras, which, you know, God love them, but the whole thing with the gala, they're just keeping exclusivity. Uh, and, and I understand why they're doing it. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to argue the reasoning. I understand why they're doing it. And it's they not even... going to, oh, sorry. It's not going to change anything. It's okay. It's not going to change anything. You know, no, I know. I know. It's not going to. Mm -mm. It's not going to do anything. It just keeps everything in place. It's already been in place. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's that whole idea of, you know, back when classical music was initially written, it was a high society thing. And they're still maintaining that. Yep. You know, it was for, it was for, um, emperors. It was for, you know, kings and queens and all of that. That's what it was. That's when it was, it came into existence and we're still behaving like that. Yeah. And the musicians were the workers. They were the, yeah. And they still are. Yeah. They still are. Yeah. They still are the workers. I mean, what somebody told me the other day, which made me laugh, she said, um, you know, musicians are like, you know, they're like glorified waiters, you know, they, they, they come in the back door, mm -hmm. they're dressed in a tux or black and white or black, you yeah. know, just like a waiter. And, uh, you know, they go in and they're part of the show or they're a piece of the show or they, they are the show, but they're still the workers and they still got to take all their crap and put it back in a box and go home. Out the back door. You know? Yeah. Out the back door, the way they came in. And they have to park uh, in obscure spots so that they're not allowed to park at the regular parking lot. 
because that's where the you know what I'm saying? I mean, this is yeah, how you are not it. getting a valet. You're not you don't get to park no. next to the stage door unless you're the that's soloist. Right. There, there ain't no valet for the musicians. The musicians got to park on the you know in the neighborhood down you know six six blocks down. Yeah, you know, I mean, pe- that's 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 what it is. Yeah, and that's what's funny is that um, the elitist stuff within musicians comes from musicians themselves. Oh, totally, it does. Oh, you 100%. know, hundred percent, it does. Yeah. And I just find it, the whole thing is just funny. It's just, if if this entire niche would stop taking itself so seriously, that would be fantastic. Yeah. It starts there. It really, it starts there. Yeah. And then getting interested in what the audience wants, because that's what's viable. You know, is my idea going to work? I hear that all the time. Is my idea going to work? Is my, is what I want to create going to work? Well, instead of asking me, have a look. Is it going to work? Does it make sense? Mm-hmm. Right? That's the first thing I'm going to ask you. Does it make sense? If you look at it, what are the holes? What What do you know about humans? What makes sense? What are you seeing in the world that justifies or says that that could work? Right. I, I, if you're not looking, you're not going to see it. I don't have your answers. You actually have your answers. You would have to open your eyes. You know? Yeah. Totally. That's, that's really what it is. And so that's, you know, um, the, that, that's a, a very big conversation that we're having here. This is a very big conversation that, um, you know, and probably is not going to be entirely popular. I'm sure there's people who are, you know, spitting nails right now about what I said about classical music. I'm sure. Yeah. This isn't an attack on classical music, by the way. This is an attack on human beings attachments to the way something needs to stay or be or how people should listen to it or what they should like or whatever. That's all attachments. Right. You're not saying Shostakovich sucks. No, I like Shostakovich. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of people don't though. I love it. But I'm not going to go and say to someone else, they should love it. You know? Right. I know. I love it so much. I call him Shosty. He's got a, he's got a nickname, but seriously, like, no, I mean, that's, but that's, what's funny about it is that, just because I like it doesn't mean somebody else likes it. Just because yeah. I think it's cool doesn't mean somebody else is going to think it's cool. And we have to stop thinking that way. This is like my, my like I told you, my stepdad, you know, he's like, I love opera. Everybody should love opera. Okay. Um, you know, that's a nice idea, but that's not reality. I like the idea of liking opera. <laughs> I know. I Actually, I do too. I like the idea of it, but am I realistically at this age, what I'm doing now, um, am I going to go sit for three or four hours and, uh, you know, at an opera? No, I'm not like, that's not going to happen. You're not going to sign up to go hear the ring cycle and not be done with it for a month. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not. Definitely not. And, and I'll tell you too, like, um, I used to go to movies all the time and I think this is also part of evolution, you know, as you know, as you grow older and you decide what you like and what you don't and what your priorities are and the culture, um, you know, like what, culture, what's absolutely. happening in our culture. Right. Exactly. I used to watch movies. I used to go to movies all the time, like, you know, go to a movie house and get popcorn and watch movies. I have not gone to a movie in probably three years, and I have no plans to go to a movie. And I don't know that movie going will ever be a big part of my life again. There was a time it was a very big part of my life. It's not anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that we have to remember is there is a, you evolve as a person. You evolve. Right. And what you prioritize now is not necessarily what you're going to prioritize forever. Right. And that's part of the, another reason why classical music has uh, lost its audience is because there are people who, I mean, hell, my parents went and listened to every concert I ever played and I mean, everything. And of course, you know, as soon as we, uh, my brother and I decided not to be in music anymore, you know, they lost two audience members. <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just, but that's just reality, right? That's human. Mm-hmm. It's not that they don't like classical music anymore, by the way, that has nothing to do with it. Right. It's just that there was a reason for them to go. And then suddenly there wasn't a reason so much for them to go anymore. And then it yeah. became not a priority. Yeah. That's what I mean by, you know, priorities. And so this is not, again, not an attack on classical music, but we, if you want to evolve classical music, you have to think differently. Right. You don't move classical music into a bar and think you're evolving classical music. That's my point. Right. You don't move private lessons online and think you're evolving classical music. No. Right. 
not it. <laughs> not it. You got to think beyond that. Yeah. Gotta think beyond that. So yeah, that's it. That's all I have to say on that topic. I don't know if you've got anything more you want to bring. I just want to say that, um, as we talked about that, the fact that this stuff actually happens in conversation and what you said to me earlier was, you know, call all these people before we started recording, call mm -hmm. 10 DJs, you know, call, yeah. you know, and get, get in a bigger conversation so that you can see what's possible. And that's actually what needs to happen. One thing I would really like to see what I would like to affect actually through crushing classical is to create actually um, a culture of collaboration in classical music, really like for real. And so that will happen in the future in, in person events. I know that it will, but for now mm -hmm. we are in the classical cats group on Facebook doing that. Right. So if, yep. if you're listening and you're not in the classical cats group, join it. Just go ahead. Yeah, and, and if you have an idea, if you have an idea and you want to talk about viability, come in the group and talk about it with us. Yeah. Or get on a hot seat I'll too. Respond. Yeah. yeah. You can get on a hot seat too. Yeah. I'll respond. And yeah. I'll respond in that group. And, um, and if you, yeah, if you want one-on-one -on -one help, uh, get on a hot seat with us. Yeah. That's what a hot seat's for. We'll talk you through your idea and we'll help you evolve it. We'll help you, um, you know, determine what would be viable. Yeah. What would work. Yeah. I mean, there's sense. a long thread in there right now. Conversation. Right. Yeah. Right now in the classical cats group, there's a long thread with someone who came in and said, Hey, I'm starting this thing. I'm just going to start. I don't know what it looks like yet, but this is where I'm starting. And we had a, yep. a long discussion under it. Hopefully, you know, we'll touch bit base with him again and see where he's at now. Like, you know, four or five days later I'm after that watching. thread. Yeah. I'm still watching what he's doing. Yeah. Me too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yep. And yeah, so I, what I'm getting really clear on is that you have to have a conversation and it has to keep continuing to be discussed. So yeah, it has, and it has to be expanded. Yeah. The yes. more people you have it with, the better. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this was a great talk, Eileen. Thank you for today. You're welcome. And we will see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you for listening today. Hey, listen, I have a huge favor to ask you, and it will only take a few seconds. If you like this show, one way that you can let us know is by writing a review on iTunes and subscribing to the podcast. Writing a review will help other people to find the podcast and help us immensely. It will only take a few minutes. Just head over to iTunes and search for Crushing Classical. There, you can write a review and click subscribe. Thanks again.